Hello, good morning to all and welcome to today's Daily Dose of Market Insights by Oenda and I'm back from my week leave. Kelvin Wong here, the Senior Market Analyst of Oenda Asia Pacific. Very good morning to all and welcome to a brand new week. Today will be the 8th of April 2024, Monday. All right, so before we start our usual Daily Dose of Market Insights, let's take a look at the disclaimers first. All right. Leverage trading carries a high degree of risk and may not be suitable for everyone. Losses can exit deposits. Uh, this uh, presentation and if uh, it's not an offer or solicitation to buy or sell, no financial advice or recommendation for any financial uh, for any investment product, pardon me, any forecast, prediction or projection in this presentation is not necessarily indicative of the future or likely performance of the product. This advertisement has not been reviewed by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. All right, so as usual, right, uh, before we jump straight into the short term technical outlook of the broad based asset classes ranging from the major stock indices, the major FX pairs, WTI crude and go XAU spec spot gold that means IEXAU slash USD. Let's have a recap of what happened last week while I was away and in terms of the market movements and as well as related uh, respective related key events and data that actually uh, kind of a that we need to be aware of all right going forward. Okay so let's start with the key events first. Okay so last week we do have a slew of Federal Reserve officials speaking and what's surprising uh, to us over here is that the number of Federal Reserve officials are getting less dovish. That means they start to shift into the less dovish camp and it's very in and this is very significant important why because at the start of this year, based on the CMAE Fed Watch 2. So for those who actually follow our daily dose of market insight, I share with you all how to actually uh, get a, a gauge of what is market participants is pricing into the expectation on Fed funds rate cut by looking at the futures, the interest rate futures market. And the easiest way we can get is from this CME Fed Watch 2 and it's available free to us. Nevertheless, it's not really that live. It's slightly delayed by an hour or so based on the Fed Funds futures rate, futures interest rate market, but it's sufficient. So in a nutshell, at the start of this year, the, the market participant in the Fed Funds futures market priced in six interest rate cut by the Fed at the start of this year. And based on the latest Fed speak and much more up to date relevant respective data like CPI and non farm payroll data. The market expectation has starts to, to, to actually reduce down from four interest rate cuts in February. And before we go, before I went for a, a one week break, somewhere around in the middle of the March, right after the FOMC meeting, the latest FOMC meeting and the release of the latest dot plot market participants has reduced their interest rate cuts from four to three and being the first rate cut to come in in June. All right, so that was the initial, uh, we call it expectation that, but last week, Pendulum has shifted the doubt, the, 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 this expectation. So let us start to look at one of this particular event over here, which is based on a Federal Reserve official Guardians or Fed speak, there's this guy called Fed uh, Kashkagri. So he actually floated the idea that there could be a possibility of no interest rate cut for this year. And this is a very, very significant uh, development because at the start of this year, there is no actually indication for any Fed funds officials in terms of the public speeches that they convey a message that there is no possibility of no interest rate cut. So at most, they actually look at maybe one interest rate cut to actually tone down the market expectation of six interest rate cut that's being priced at the start of this year. So this is pretty much of a uh, interesting development. Uh, why? Because if there is no interest rate cuts by the Fed this year, markets will be disappointed from the risk assets point of view. Why? Because uh, risk assets require liquidity to drive the market. And what's mean by liquidity? That means uh, we're talking about interest rate cuts to actually to actually sustain the high PE ratio of the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100. 
Okay, so that actually explain why the U.S. stock market uh, had a rather relatively uh, weak week last week. Okay, so that I'll share with you the weekly performance of the S&P, the Nasdaq 100, uh, the Russell 2000, as well as the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So, uh, in fact, uh, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500 has a weak week, uh, as has a way called a weak performance last week. So, last week losses was actually the worst uh, since the start of this year. All right, so that is one possibility uh, of possible this this is what I call rather less dovish. Uh, we call it uh, 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 Federal Reserve officials that tend to actually uh, ev eventually will reduce the Fed dovish people optimism that the market participant has starts to price at the start of this year. And also, do not forget on top of that, on last Friday we do have the non-farm payroll data which came in way way stronger than expected. So if you look at uh, last Friday non-farm payroll data, okay, over here, pardon me, this. Yeah, last Friday. Okay, so non-farm payroll data, if you look at my screen, so hopefully let me expand my screen so that you guys could see much clearer. So non-farm payroll data came in at 303k jobs added, way above the 200k jobs that was actually uh, being expected by market uh, forecast and way also above the previous month of February 270k at the job and the rest of other uh, we call it a metrics in to gauge the job uh, market uh, the unemployment rate actually slipped down slightly lower uh, by 0.1% 3.8% from 3.9% and also uh, came in uh, above expectation as well and what we could see over here is that hourly earnings year on year uh, came in uh, more or less being expectation at 4.1% year on year. So what we could see over here is that job markets are still relatively healthy, uh, kind of a uh, in a rosy, uh, in a, a ro rosy footing, I would say. So that could actually reduce the urgency or, or uh, reduce the need for the Fed to actually uh, starts to actually cut interest rate because we talk about if the if the economy is doing relatively fine there is no need for the fed to actually cut rates but that may not be good for risk assets why because risk assets tends to uh price in at the start of this year that we may start to see six interest rate cut to give additional liquidity to the market so that should explain the lackluster performance of the s p 500 and the rest of the US uh, stock major, stock indices last week. So now, if what we could see over here is one more thing I want to highlight over here is the rally of gold and WTI crude oil prices. So, so we know that WTI crude oil prices uh, added a weekly gain of 4.21% last week. Okay, and this WTI crude oil price is very important. Why? Because we know that WTI crude oil prices drive inflationary expectation. As you know, if oil price keep going up, it will tend to filter down to our cost of goods and services. So eventually, your CPI uh, a, 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 a number or the CPI data will start to slowly increase as well going forward into the Q, the H2, the second half of this year. So if you look at the correlation between WTI crude oil price, okay, let me share with you over here. So this is the weekly chart of West Texas oil uh, as being priced by Wenda's platform. So what you could see over here is that this is one of the, uh, uh, we got those who actually um, uh, took, uh, we call it attended my Q1 outlook. Uh, I just shared this is one of the key risk factor that could actually derail that red hot rally in the S&P 500, which is WTI oil price. Why? Because it's shaping this double bottom formation with the neckline resistance at 93.40 slash 95.50, which is fast approaching. And yesterday's last week, pardon me, rally of 4.1% is the second best weekly gains that is seen so far this year. All right, so now let me plot you the chart of S&P 500 to overlay it so that you guys could actually have a better understanding why WTI crude oil price has an inverse correlation with the S&P 500, all right? So now let me, okay, this is the, I'm using Oenda's price uh, data, okay, SPX 500 USD. So let me pull it as a new plane over here. Okay, that, this one, let me push it up. Okay, so that you guys could see. Okay, good. Okay, so at the bottom over here is the SPX. Okay, at the top is the WTI crude oil price. 
All right, so what you could see over here is that previously there's this sharp rally uh, during the onset of the Ukraine-Russia uh, invasion. After price, WTI Corp price right, rallied, the S&P did that medium-term corrective decline of more than uh, this one, this time around, if you look at closing price over here of 25%. And during the summer months of last year where WTI crude oil broke above this uh, bullish descending wedge configuration at this point in time, it rallied up, hit that neckline resistance, the double bot the, this uh, current double bottom neckline resistance at 9340, 950, your S&P 500, Decline by around 11%. Okay, and what we are seeing right now is that there may be, it may be start to see another round of moment, positive momentum that what we see in the summer months of last year. So if this price action behavior were to repeat again, it will be highly possible that the S and P 500 could actually shape similar multi-week corrective decline like what we see in Q3 last year. Okay, something to bear in mind of. So that's actually why I explained the luck luster movement of the S&P 500 last week. Okay, and this is, from a, this is from a technical perspective based on its core relationship. Then if you want to argue it from a fundamental point of view, let me share with you this chart over here. So this particular chart, what I did is I plot the WTI crude oil price together with the five year and the 10 year break even inflation. This is considered as a medium term and long term break even inflation. So these are available in the market. That means there is actually a market available for trading on break even inflation. The week in uh, the ticker called the coin tips are TIPS. So it's part of the US Treasury market. But this break even inflation is slightly different. Uh, it's, it's not based on nominal inflation. It's actually having a gauge on what market participant in the tips market is pricing in five years from today, what will be the inflation like in US and 10 years from today, what will be the inflation be in US. So it's a bit of forward looking based on market uh, participant uh, expectation from the trading of TIPS, tips, the tips market. So if you look at the five-year break even inflation, it seems to me that it have formed a medium term low in early December last year, and it starts to inch up higher, both the five-year and the 10-year break even inflation. And bearing in mind over here, that this break even inflation also has a spillover impact on the US 10-year Treasury yield as well. So you know, notice that the US Treasury yield also make a medium-term low at 18th of December, slightly later, and starts to inch up higher together in line with the five-year and the 10-year break even. So what is actually ex markets expecting right now is that future inflation expectation is expected to go higher. So if future inflation expectation expect to go higher, it means that the Fed do wish pivot optimism that is being priced at the start of this year will get reduced because inflation pressure may start to kick back into the US. And bear in mind that we know that CPI, PPI, CPI data, PPI data, as, and as well as the PCE data, those data are lagging in nature because they record price of goods one month before. Whereas WTI crude oils are WTI crude price are forward looking, break even inflation market based on the tips are forward looking as well. And also I want to bear in mind, of, I want to show you highlight the co positive correlation between the WTI crude oil with break even inflation. They move hand in hand. So primarily speaking, the main factor that's driving this inflation break even rate higher, that means i.e. higher future inflation in US potentially is due to the bullish momentum that we see in WTI crude oil price, which eventually will drive up the cost of funding higher as implied by the US 10-year Treasury yield, which also indicate to us the Fed may not be so aggressive in cutting rates this year. Okay, so that actually does not bore well for risk assets like stocks, okay, which is oh, potentially, okay. So what we could see explanation why WTI crude oil pricing is rising so is rising so much last week because of number one joyous political risk tension 
in the Middle East is not coming down and in fact it may start to go up higher. Why? Because last week uh, Israel actually uh, launched a kind of a, a attack on the Iran embassy in Syria and there's a bit, a bit of tick for tat over here saying that Iran may actually start to be more aggressive towards Israeli assets in the Middle East. So that could actually drive up WTI oil prices and not forgetting last week we do have the OPEC plus meeting. Uh, the big brother Saudi Arabia still sticking to their stance of not increasing supply and maintaining their supply cut. Uh, that was actually mentioned at the start of this year. So it seems to be asked that oil price could be indirectly to be used as a weapon uh, to actually ask US to actually pressure Israel to actually tone down their hostility towards uh, the Gaza, Hamas in Gaza. Okay, so uh, when, when will this joyous political tension end? Nobody knows, but for us, we monitor the price action of WTI crude oil, which indicate to us the medium term uptrend still remains intact. As I shared with you in my screen earlier. Okay, so now with that, let us take a look at the weekly uh, performance of the S&P 500. So if you look at the weekly performance of the S&P 500, like I share with you over here. Okay, so the S&P 500 actually tested the 20 day moving average and the recovery it recovered on last Friday. So later I'll tell you what, what is the possibility why it recovered on last Friday, but let me flash you the weekly performance chart first. Okay, so it's down negative 0.95%. So this is the worst weekly return on the S&P 500 since the 2nd of January, all right? The higher beta NASDAQ 100. Okay, it's down negative 0.8%, almost the same. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is now testing the 50-day moving average, which is down by negative 2.27%. Okay, so this red return was is the worst return seen so far at the start of this year. All right, which is over here. Okay, previously negative 0.59%. Okay, this is the start of this year. So, so far, this is the worst re return so far since the start of this year, weekly year. Then we have the Russell 2000. Okay, failure to break above this key resistance over here. And it's down negative 2.87%. So that's actually also the worst weekly return since the start of this year as well. Okay, and what's interesting over here is that during this, uh, we call it a uh, 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 spike in WTI crude oil price, gold price also went up as well. So despite the fact that you know that the US 10 year treasury yield went up, but gold price actually rallied. So the, the reason why gold price rallied, so if you look at the gold price over here, XAU slash USD. So this is the weekly return of gold price. So it actually rallied by positive. So it's formed a very strong bullish Marabuzu weekly candlestick last week, a rally of positive 4.35%. 4, 4 so this is the second best rally, weekly rally so far since the 4th of March rally at 4.63%. All right. So since uh, March over here, the breakout of this congestion zone, that means in early March, gold prices has been rallying up very, very strongly. So the, 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 the interesting about gold price over here is that the rally in gold price, uh, it break the traditional correlation with the US 10 year treasury yield. So previously, most of the time, if you see US 10 year treasury yield inching higher, gold price gains is likely to be kept. Why? Because due to a higher cost of uh, opportunity cost of holding gold, because gold doesn't give you, uh, it doesn't like a fixed income, I mean, it's a zero, uh, interest bearing asset if you hold on to gold. But the reason why gold price is rising right now is due to a uh, joyous political tension and it's all due to the fact that the US Federal Reserve, uh, uh, we call it, may start to face a very tough decision making process at this point in time because of supply side inflation coming back into the picture. And due to supply side inflation coming back to the picture, there could be a risk of stagflation coming back into the global economy again. So that actually explains why 
gold price is benefiting from this potential stagflation environment and a safe haven due to rising joyous political uh, tension in the Middle East. And given that you know that gold prices uh, tends to be have a direct indirect correlation with uh, dollar, so last week dollar actually didn't actually rally much, despite the rising U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. So if you look at the dollar index last week, according to has it actually inched down slightly lower, uh, negative 0.25% for the week, and it can't break above the medium term resistance at 104.85 over here. You tested one time, two time, but it still managed to hold above the 20 day, the 50 day, and the 200 day moving average that is acting as a support at 103. 70 level distorted line over here. So it's more like a range bound situation for the dollar. Why range bound? Because uh, of the effect of the negating effect from a strong goal. All right. So that is pretty much of a uh, bigger picture intermarket relationship. So I hope that uh, I could explain as clear as possible of the ongoing mechanics in the market right now. So with that, let's uh, let us now jump straight into the short term technical outlook on the various uh, broad-based cross-asset classes, starting from the major stock indices first, all right? Major stock indices. Okay, so let, let us start with the Hong Kong 33 index or the Hun Seng index. So let me expand my screen so that you guys could see much clearer. All right, so no change. The Hun Seng index remains trapped below the 16,960 short-term pivotal uh, resistance that I highlighted last Thursday before I went for my leave. So it starts to trade sideways. Uh, and this resistance over here is also confluence with the former ascending channel support that I drew from the low of 22nd of January at this point in time. So what we could see over here is that uh, upside momentum seems to be lagging, uh, which actually uh, put this corrective uh, rebound scenario or a, or a kind of a mean reversion rebound scenario that was kickstarted in 22nd of January this year, below the 200-day moving average. So, like 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 we uh, highlighted, the longer-term major downtrend on the Hong Kong 33 index still remains intact. So, if you look at the daily chart over here, this is the daily chart. It still remains below this long-term circular bearish trend since February 2021, right? Over here, this trend channel. Okay, so it can't break above this trend channel as long as it remains below 200 day moving average. It was the major downtrend of the Hong Kong 33 still remains intact. So, whatever we see so far, the rebound from the low of 22nd of January is more like a counter trend rebound or a corrective rebound within its major downtrend phase. So, there's still no clear signs of a major basing scenario yet on the Hong Kong 33 index. So, on the shorter term, uh, we will still maintain that bearish bias in the shorter term for today, 16,960 short term pivotal res resistance to maintain the short term bearish bias, more like a range bound scenario. The first support level to watch for today will be 16,635, which is the low of 22nd of March. So it's more like a bottom of a mini range configuration also confluence with the 50-day moving average. Only a breakdown below 16,335 may expose the next near-term support level at 16,135, which is the defined by the minor swing low of 5th of March and 7th of March. Only an hourly close above 16,960 will invalidate the short-term bearish bias to see the continuation of this minor corrective rebound scenario. First resistance level to watch next will be at 17,230, which is the minor swing high of 13th of March. And above it sees a test at the key 200 day moving average, acting as a resistance as well at 17,560 slash 17,600. The Nikkei 225. So, what we could see the Nikkei 225 over here is doing this minor corrective rebound scenario or a counter trend rebound scenario after hitting the lower limit of this minor descending channel that I drew from the high of 22nd of March. So for those who knows a bit of Elliott Wave, it has completed a five wave down scenario, wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, wave five, with a wave five target at 38.776. So if we do the FIBO extension, taking from the start of the wave one, project it down to the low of the wave three, towards the start of wave four, it gives you 0.76. Okay, give me it. 
yeah, 0.764 as well. All right. So what we could see over here is that potentially right now is it coming very close to the top of the channel. So I do not want to chase this rally anymore. So instead, I will still maintain that bearish bias closer towards the 39,990 level, which is the top of this the descending channel resistance. And if I were to do the feeble retracement of this ongoing minor downtrend, it's close to the 50% feeble retracement. Uh, but I'll be using slightly higher, the 61.8 feeble uh, golden ratio, the 61.8 feeble retracement golden ratio, confluencing with 40,260, which is the swing high area of 4th of April that kickstarted this last leg of swift decline as my short term pivotal resistance for a bearish bias scenario. So as long as 40,260 is not surpassed to the upside, short-term bearish bias into any potential strength that we see in the Japan 225 to for the next intermediate near-term support level to come in at 39,060 followed by 38,770 which was last Friday swing low and the 50-day moving average a break below 38,770 risk of exposing the next support level at 38,340 which is the swing low area of 12th of March and 15th of March and as well as the pullback support of that former uh, major ascending channel that was actually broken up earlier on 14th of February now turns into a pullback support this dotted uh, light cyan blue line over here that I drew all right so if we go to the one hour so that pullback support also correspond to the 38,340 level. Okay, only hourly close above the 40,260 short-term pivotal resistance will invalidate the short-term bearish bias on the Japan 225 to see a potential squeeze up for the next intermediate resistance to come in at 40,760 followed by the current all-time high area at 41,150 level. Now, what's next for the German 30? So German 30, if you recall last week, we will, that's the only index that we will still maintain that bearish, bullish bias, pardon me, not bearish bias, bullish bias, and it indeed hit our resistance level at 18,650 before shaping down that bearish reversal, and it broke below the minor ascending channel support that we drew from the low of 14th of February that previously kept the higher low intact on the German 30 index. So with this latest price development, very likely the German 30 index right now is doing a minor corrective decline or the start of a minor downtrend phase within its major uptrend phase that's still intact. So using last Thursday swing high, which is so correspond to the pullback resistance of the former minor ascending channel support that I drew from the low for the middle of uh, February, 18,485. So any potential bounce that didn't surpass 18,485, we will flip to a short term bearish bias on the German 30 index. Next support level to watch will be at 18,050, followed by 17,900. Only an hourly close above 18,485 will invalidate this short-term bearish bias on the German 30 to resume its impulsive up move leg for the next resistance to come in at 18,650 followed by 18,775. US stock index, let's start with the NASDAQ 100. So NASDAQ 100 continue to remain uh, rather lackluster, hit that short-term support level that we highlighted on last Friday, last Thursday, pardon me for my leave, very close to it, 7,840 before rebounding off again. So if you look at the way it rebound, it fails to break above the 20-day moving average and throughout the later part of last Friday, UX price action, it started to trade sideways. And also very interestingly, it also broke down this minor bearish ascending wage support level that I drew from the low of 22nd of February and now it turns into a pullback support at this 18,233 level. So I don't want to use the 18,233 level as my short-term pivotal resistance for today. So uh, just to, in case of any whipsaw, given the fact that the Nasdaq 100 uh, tends to trade 
in a wider range. Uh. So uh, no change, I'll be still using the 18,470 as my short term pivotal resistance. So as long as this level didn't surpass to the upside, we will still maintain that short term bearish bias on the NASDAQ 100. All right, for the next support level to watch, for sure will be at 17,840. A breakdown below 17,840 exposes 17,560, which is this minor congestion area over here from 21st of February. Only hourly close back above 18,470 will invalidate this short term bearish bias to see the continuation of the impulsive up move to expose the next uh, resistance at 18,620, followed by 18,880. Then the U.S. Wall Street. So the U.S. Wall Street last Friday, Thursday, it broke below the expanding wedge configuration support level that I drew from the low of 14th of February. Now it turns into a pullback resistance. What you could see over here, uh, last Friday, non-farm payroll data release, push up, can't break and starts to trade sideways over here. Right. So with that, right, uh, are you, this will be the first resistance level to watch, 39,080. Uh, I will not use this as a short term pivotal resistance because it's too tight. I'd rather use the this swing high over here that kick started that trigger the, the the very steep decline on last Thursday. And if you will do the FIBO retracement of this entire ongoing minor downtrend pace, it's close to the 61.8 FIBO retracement as well. All right. So with that, uh, 39,365 short term pivotal resistance, as long as this level is not surpassed to the upside, still maintain that short term bearish bias on the US Wall Street 30. 39,365. Next support level to watch will be at 38,450. A breakdown below 38,450 exposes this support over here, which is the swing low of 15th of February and 14th of February at 38,200 slash 38,060. Only hourly close above 39,365 will invalidate this short term bearish bias to see a potential squeeze up to expose the next uh, resistance at 39,990, which is the current all time high area above it sees 40,245. All right. So net net overall, uh, we beat all the uh, Last week, whatever minor bounce that we see so far on the major stock indices still remains kept below their key short term respective pivotal resistance. All right. So now FX market. So given the dollar is kind of going sideways over here. So let us start with the European currency. So the European currency as expected before we went on leave hit the short term support level before uh, rebounding on early part of last week. All right. So what we could see over here that potentially, right, this could be in the midst of a counter trend rebound scenario as well. So with that, uh, I'll be using a short term pivotal support on the euro dollar for today for 1.0775 short term pivotal support level uh, to actually uh, uh, main, have this short term bullish bias for today for this ongoing minor counter trend rebound scenario to play up. A break above 1.0850, which is the 20 day moving average, I think as a resistance potentially exposes the next resistance level at 1.0890. So what's what? 1.0890 is in fact this minor descending trend line that I drew from 8 of March. So potentially, right, it could be from 14th of February, the euro dollar is now trading in a symmetrical triangle range configuration. And right now we are potentially seeing the top the price action to retest the upper limit of this symmetrical triangle range configuration. So with that, uh, I will have a short a bullish bias scenario within this symmetrical triangle range configuration uh, with the resistance at 1.0890. Only a breakdown below 1.0775 short term pivotal support will uh, see further potential weakness on the euro dollar to expose last week low at 1.0725, which is close to the lower limit of this symmetrical triangle range, minor range configuration. Similar on the sterling dollar hitting our support level as well at 1.2540 last week and started to shape a bounce and managed to recapture the 200 day moving average. So with that, uh, I'll be using 1.2575 as my short term pivotal support for today to have this short term bullish bias for this minor counter trend rebound scenario to play out on the sterling dollar 
intermediate resistance to watch will be at 1.2645. Above it exposes 1.2685, which is the 50 day and the 20 day moving average also acting close as a resistance and as well as this graphical minor descending trend line that I drew from the high of 8 of March. So uh, flipping to a short term bullish bias for today on the sterling dollar for this minor counter trend rebound scenario to play out. So like a stress again, the price action on the sterling dollar and the euro dollar is more skewed towards a minor, minor counter trend rebound rather than the start of a much more uh, short term uptrend phase for the euro dollar or the sterling dollar. Only hourly close below 1.2575 will negate this minor counter trend rebound scenario on the sterling dollar to expose last week low at 1.2540. Below it uh, sees the, the psychological level of 1.25 figure level. We also correspond to the minor swing low of 8th of December and 14th of December. Okay, so that's for the sterling dollar. Asia Pacific currency, uh, the Aussie dollar going to be trapped like a sideways range. So what we could see over here is also trading in a symmetrical triangle range configuration since the low of 13th of February and whatever upside is being kept by the upper limit of this symmetrical triangle range configuration. All right, so last week's push up, then it can't break up and starts to trade downward as well. So it's a very messy range configuration for the Aussie dollar. So with that, right, I'll be using the upper limit over here at 65 66.50 so this is all correspond very closely to this swing high here which is the upper limit okay this level 66.50 so I'll, I'll put it slightly higher 66.50 short-term pivotal resistance on the Aussie dollar so any potential bounce that didn't surpass 66.50 we will have that short-term bearish bias on the Aussie dollar first resistance support level to watch 65.40 below it exposes 65 figure level which is also close to the lower limit of this ongoing symmetrical triangle range configuration on the Aussie dollar only an hourly close above 66.50 will uh, invalidate this short-term bearish bias to see a potential squeeze up to retest the 8th of March swing high area at 66.55. Above it exposes 67.10 level, which is the minor swing high area of 12th of January, and as well as the 61.8 FIBO retracement of that previous decline from 28th of December to 14th of February, which confluences at the 67.10 resistance level as well. Okay, dollar yen. Okay, dollar yen could need to be rather uh, tricky uh, because there's risk of intervention as well as it approaches the 51.95 level. Uh, so no change still using that 51.95 level as my short-term pivotal range, uh, pivotal resistance level to maintain that bearish short-term bearish bias within a range scenario. First support level to watch will be at 50.90 for sure, which also correspond to last Friday minor uh, swing low area during the Asia session before the Reddit and also close right now also the 20 day moving average is also acting as a support at this level as well 1590. A break below 1590 exposes the next near term resistance at 5030 which is the minor swing low area of 21st of March and 19th of March. Only an hourly close above 5195 will invalidate this short term bearish bias on the dollar yen to see a squeeze up towards the next resistance at 5280 followed by 5360. All right. Spot go. So spot go continues to remain bullish over here. So uh, during today's uh, Asia session, it managed to uh, to see that to shape that minor pullback before shaping a rally and print another fresh autumn high again. All right. So uh, with that, uh, I don't want to have a so tight short term pivotal uh, support at twenty three zero two, uh, which is two thousand three hundred level. Uh, so I'll reuse slightly lower, which is much more uh, clear in terms of graphical resistance because it's tested one time, two time, and three time over here. Okay, so this is 2,265, which also corresponds to last Friday swing low. So as long as any potential minor decline or pullback didn't surpass below 2,265, we will still maintain that short-term bullish bias on spot go XAU slash USD. Next resistance to look out for will be 2370 followed by 24 figure level in the short term for spot goal. Only an hourly close below 2265 will negate this short term bullish bias to see an extension of the minor corrective decline towards the next support level at 2006, which is correspond to the 20 day moving average. A break below it exposes 2157, which is the minor swing low area of 21st of March and 23rd, 22nd of March.
right so lastly wti crude oil price before we go okay wti crude oil price okay so wti crude oil uh, hit our resistance on last thursday before i went for my holiday a one week break at 84 okay give me now 84.90 so what we could see over here it managed to did that retracement and it did bounce again from here so with that uh potentially what we could see is that we see a start of a trend short-term trend bullish trend exhaustion by this uh bearish divergence that's being seen on the hourly rsi okay price action ship high high and also the price action managed to also react off the upper limit of this minor ascending channel that i drew from the low of 5th of february so potentially we could be in the midst of this mean short-term mean reversion decline scenario within its uh, short-term uptrend that is still intact why because it's still trading above the 20-day moving average so with that uh, i'll be using 89 figure level slightly above 80s 790 level 89 figure level so what's 89 figure level if you go to the FIBO retracement the the, the FIBO retracement is actually the 74.6 percent FIBO retracement from that previous decline from 28th of September to 13th of December 78.5 76.4 FIBO retracement over here. So this 89 figure level will be my short-term pivotal resistance that I have for WTI crude oil price for today to flip to a short-term bearish bias for this potential minor mean reversion decline scenario to play out. First support level for, to watch for sure will be 84.90 where it has been tested in today's early Asia session. A breakdown below it exposes 83.20, which is also close to the 20-day moving average that's coming at a support level as well. Only an hourly close above 89 figure level will invalidate this short-term mean reversion decline scenario to resume its impulsive up move within its short-term uptrend phase for the next resistance to come in at 90.70. Above 9070 exposes 9340, which is the neckline resistance of that West Texas crude oil. So bear in mind, if you look at the weekly chart, this is the neckline resistance, the double bottom. Okay, 9340, 9550. Okay, so with that, that sums up the short-term technical outlook on the various cost as major cost as on the various uh, cost assets. Now let us take a look at the economic calendar of what are the data to look out for for today. All right as we as the days goes by so for today it's a rather quiet day as well so not much key data that is out during the european session uh not not nothing but that 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 that, that fantastic so uh let me just double confirm the impact yeah yeah pretty much quiet uh uh economic calendar for today so let me explain to you all that what one of the reasons why the the major u.s stock indices bounce on friday after the release of the non-farm payroll and also despite the U.S. 10-year treasury yield inching higher is due to the fact this week is earnings week for the U.S. That means i.e. we kickstart Q1 earnings announcement in U.S. unofficially with the start of the major banks that is due on Friday. Okay, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, BlackRock and Citigroup. So we'll talk more about that uh, in terms of the earnings expectation and how could it impact the major US stock indices as we head closer to this particular Friday. All right, so that could actually explain a bit of what I call front line, a bit of what I call optimism on a potential uh, robust earnings growth for these uh, banks that is kicking start on Friday itself. But man, nevertheless, we still got to pay attention to the price action uh, step by step as we actually add, uh, take a look at their short term price action development on the hourly chart, which I did share with you all earlier on. All right. So with that, uh, have a great day ahead. Uh, today's uh, daily dose will be a bit longer. Why? Because I need to share with you all the significant development that has taken shape on the global markets last week. So with that, have a great trading day. Have a great day ahead and we shall speak again tomorrow. Thank you.